Welcome to Keep Trucking Personal, where we invite you to explore the heart and soul of our company, Kiwi Brothers Trucking. Through engaging storytelling, insightful market updates, and vibrant energy, our podcast reflects our culture, values, and achievements. Whether you're a team member or industry enthusiast, join us to build connections, foster growth, and inspire excellence. Discover why we're more than just a company. We're a community, a catalyst for positive change, and a home for those aspiring to be part of something extraordinary. The pre-trip is complete and engine's ready. We're set to hit the road on the Keep Trucking Personal Podcast. Let's go. Welcome back to Keep Trucking Personal. My name is Tyler Keevy and I'm your host. Today's guest has taken two trips to Alaska at his, with his duration at Keevy Brothers Trucking. Rick Thompson, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, well, I'm excited. I know we just talked about this earlier and you're coming up on your fifth year anniversary with us. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I hope to have several more if my body will hold out. <laughs> I hear you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into trucking and how long you've been in here? a little bit of everything. I worked most of my life in warehousing, warehouse management, and ended up in quality control at a big company in Richmond, Virginia. And they, I retired from there. They offered early retirement and I wasn't ready to retire at that time. That's about 10 years ago. So I took about a year off and tried starting my own business, landscaping. Didn't like that too hot. <laughs> I hear you. Decided to try trucking and got my CDL and worked for another company for four years. And that just wasn't going anywhere. And a couple of people from there had moved over here and I came here. This is really my second job. Wow. Yeah, that's typically a lot of veteran drivers have been in it since they kind of grew up in it or started in their family. So when you got out of warehousing and then decided to get your CDL, was there somebody that you were already talking to that was driving that kind of motivated you to do it? I had managed the shipping and receiving, basically doing all the dispatching. So I've got several friends that were drivers and drove all their life. And I knew there was pretty easy money compared yeah. to have it and not having to work for someone directly it's that's a big thing for trucking too you're we're kind of on our own now yeah it's a little freedom of the road yeah yeah so did you have to go to a truck driving school or did you get it just on your own because you had experience in it from the i should have gotten it on my own i went to a truck driving school and i won't say where but it was not a good experience so is that the company that you drove for for the four years prior to coming here? No, I was supposed to drive for that company for a year, but ended up having to get lawyers involved and I got, they let me out of the contract. Okay. It was, it was bad. So was that company a flatbed company as well prior to us or were you in van? They did a little of both. I was in van though. Okay. So the flatbed transition coming here was quite a bit different then. Well, it's really what I wanted to do anyway. Okay. I didn't want to just swing doors. I wanted, you know, I'm almost 60 years old in July and I wanted the, you know, the extra work of securing and not necessarily tarping anymore. That was starting to hurt, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wanted the actual extra work to just keep me in a little better shape out here. Yeah. Well, and you're currently under an oversized load, right? Mm -hmm. So you get that diversity as well, like flatbed, chaining, strapping, tarping occasionally, some overdimensional, kind of yep. really, you dove into it all. Not much I haven't done now. <laughs> so what is your favorite part other than having the freedom? Like, is there a certain, I know you live in North Carolina, where do you enjoy going the most? What's the best trip you can think of other than Alaska, where we're going to get to soon? Fact of the matter is I'm here to make money. Yeah. So. For me, the best runs are the money making runs. And I Amen. like going longer runs. Yeah. Going across 80, 90, even 40, all the, you know, coast to coast, 
would be the perfect job for me. But, you know, unfortunately, that don't happen all the time. But I love I, the the Pacific Northwest is beautiful. And when I think of you as a professional driver, to your point, you have that flexibility. You do very well. And, and our planners take care of staying ahead of you. And it's one of the concepts I've talked about before is that professionalism, reliability, honesty, integrity, you deliver all of that. And it helps us keep you moving. It helps keep you making money and enjoying the road with all those different freight types. It only makes sense. Communication is the key to everything. and. I update the DM two or three times a day. You know, when if I tell her I can deliver by nine tomorrow morning, but I hit traffic and now it's going to be 10, even that one hour, I'll update her. Yeah. So where did that piece of work ethic come from? Because coming into trucking, sometimes it can be a little too relaxed, you could say. And those ETAs yeah. and that communication can kind of go to the wayside. What kept you at such a high standard? Probably where I was scheduling in all the trucks for all of our shipping Mm -hmm. and having one late just threw such a kink into everything. It just rippled on down. I mean, it messed the whole day up if two or three trucks are late. So you felt it firsthand when you were in the warehouse inside that, hey, I'll be there at eight and it's noon and the trucks doesn't show up. It crinkled your whole day up. So that gave you that motivation to say, hey, I'm going to, my integrity is my integrity. And if I say eight o'clock, barring any traffic or unforeseen delays, I'm going to be there. Right. Exactly. So one of the things that I like to ask guys a lot is what time do you start your morning? If you had to choose, like, I know there's all kinds of factors, but do you start, are you three o'clock in the morning? Are you five o'clock? Midnight. You're midnight. Yeah. Yep. Between 12 and 1 is, I would consider that a perfect start time. Yeah. I'm not fighting for parking in the, you know, late in the evening. Yeah, I, most of the time I can plan it to where I avoid, like I'm going through Chicago. After this, I could drive some more today, but I can't deliver this till Monday anyway. So I'm just going to stay here and drive through Chicago in early mo- uh, morning tomorrow. Yeah. That's discipline. Getting up that early is not easy every day. I love it. (laughs) Going to bed is the hard thing. It's not hard getting up if you go to bed early enough. (laughs) You got that right. There's so many distractions. If you think of TV and satellite and going into, and then you still have responsibilities too, whether it's clothes, you know, washing clothes or this and that. Sometimes you can get carried away and can kind of pinch into your sleep time. I, I don't wash clothes on the road anymore. I bought enough clothes to make it three to four months. <laughs> there you go. Tips for everyone. Stock up. My wife hates me when I go home because I'm carrying in two or three laundry bags or big trash bags and a clothes basket. She's like, you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's stay efficient. Well, Rick, one of the main topics that I'm excited to talk to you about, because I've personally taken a trip to Alaska in a truck. And I know you've taken two trips, especially one in the summer and one in the winter. Mm-hmm. Let's get into that a little bit. Like, let's start with whichever trip you want to start first. And let's just go through the trip and, and how it went. And, and one of my main things that I want to ask and think through is, were you present the whole time? Because sometimes there's so much going on that you, I don't know, you can almost forget it, right? Like for me, when, when I went up there, it was so fast paced because I was teaming it with another driver. And I, although I do remember a lot, I still was like, I wish I would have taken in those views more. I wish I would have taken more pictures. I wish I would have maybe taken a few minutes to stop and meet some people because there's so many little like outposts, you could call it. My first trip was the winter trip. I, I would highly recommend a summer trip before you do the winter one. <laughs> yeah. It was a very uh, interesting and learning experience, but it was good. It was better than I expected. I was aware the whole time because I, I it was so beautiful and so different that I was I was stopped a lot the first trip and took a whole lot of pictures and sending them to everybody. They just couldn't believe the roads were the way they were for as long as they were that bad. I mean, from basically from Edmonton all the way to Anchorage, I never saw asphalt. <laughs> yeah. And so where did you start? Where did that trip start? That one started in, uh, it was the trailer place, I think, in South Dakota. 
Okay. So South Dakota to Fairbanks? No, that one went to Anchorage. Okay. So like you said, the trip, it almost feels like you're leaving earth a little bit, right? Like you get up there and you don't see cars for a while. There's a oh, lot of. There's sometimes you might go four or five hours without seeing another vehicle. Yeah. Uh, you don't have cell service most of the time. Once you get, even before you get to the Yukon, you even lose Cirrus XM. You're yeah. above the range of the satellites. And fuel in depth, it, even if you've got three quarters of a tank, if you find somewhere that takes EFS, stop and get fuel. <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's one opportunity you don't pass up. Anytime there's a fuel stop, you're yes. pulling in and topping off. Same with DEF. Whenever we secure a trip to Alaska and whatever driver's taking it, we yeah, I kind of have a little guide that I send them to help prepare. Yeah. And one of the main things is, is like, here's your fuel stops and make sure you load up on boxed def to have that. Cause you can't rely on it being in the middle of nowhere and you never know when you'll need it. And several other places during the winter had def, but it was frozen. Yeah. Well, their winter starts early up there too. Yes, it does. I took four boxes with me, ended up coming back with one. Yeah. So you're on the way up there. It's cold. What kind of wildlife did you see? Mostly on on the winter trip, I saw some uh, elk, a whole bunch of bison. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. And you really got to pay attention because that's their land. They own it. They'll lay right in the middle of the road. They won't get up. I had one situation where there was about a hundred of them laying in the road and I'd inch up and a couple would get up and move. But I got to this one really big one. And he would not move. I could not get by him. So I even inched up and just touched him. Mm -hmm. it, he didn't care. So I, I opened the door and just, you know, sticking my head out, start yelling at him. He finally stood up. And that thing is so much bigger than you would ever think they are. His head was taller than the hood of that. I had the big Peterbilt back then. Yeah. That was really interesting. <laughs> Man versus wild. That's what it feels like when you're up there. I, I thought I was going to have to just stay there till he was really ready to leave because he, he did not plan on leaving. I can tell you that. Yeah, he's warm. He was building heat. I didn't see much else on the, the winter trip, though. No, I've, you know, bears are hibernating. And, but we, I saw several elk and, uh, just like I said, the buff. Oh, I did see two moose. Forgot about those. But, yeah, I did see two moose. So do you remember, I can't remember the exact city, but there's like a lake that you kind of circle around. I don't remember if it was in the Yukon or if it was up in British Columbia, but it was like the most pristine looking, like you come, you're like circling it for, it felt like an hour. And it's all switchback cuts back and forth, getting yeah. around to the side of it. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the lake either. That was one of the most beautiful parts of the trip. Yeah. The second trip we went up there, Judd was with us, with me. He said, this is where I need to retire. <laughs> oh, it's, it's magical. So on the first trip, did you go with another driver or were you solo on that one? There were three drivers about a day and a half ahead of me. Okay. And then the second one, like you just said, you and Judd ran together the whole trip. Yeah. Yeah. We met up uh, in the States here and ran the whole way. The trip back, I uh, was about 300 miles from Dawson Creek, which I remember that because that's the only city that had a driver's side window available. It was minus 10 degrees, and I had a chunk of ice fly off another tractor trailer that was coming at me and hit the driver's side window and shattered it. I tried to take duct tape and tape cardboard on the window. It's too cold at minus 10. This cheap duct tape I had would not stick. So I ended up taking a blanket, a spare blanket, draping it over the window and shutting it in the window. And I drove 300 miles to Dawson Creek with everything I owned on, long johns, sweatshirts. <laughs> like you're riding a snowmobile. Yep, exactly, for 300 miles. Anytime I needed to make a left turn, I had to, I had to pull up the, the, the quilt 
<laughs> so I can see the mirror. <laughs> well, and that's funny that you bring that up because typically whenever somebody goes to Alaska, we anticipate putting a new windshield in because there's so I much gravel. There's so much gravel they put on the roads, especially in January to give traction that it's like when you pass each other, you're preparing for a rock to come up and, and crack that windshield. Yep. I had to get a windshield on both trips. Talking about the gravel they put down, they don't even try to scrape the road. They actually pack down the road and then they just spread this like shale, thin, real sharp gravel across the top. But you're driving 50, 60 miles an hour on it and people are people are behind you. Other truck drivers, you know, the locals up there, they're behind you getting mad because you're only going 50 or 60. Mm-hmm. I kept it around that. I, a couple times on the long straight, I might have hit 65, but I'm like, this is solid ice. I can't do this. It just don't feel right. <laughs> so when you got up to Alaska Anchorage, did you spend a day or two up there and kind of just take it in? I did a 34. I Ubered around, went to a couple restaurants, went to, they called it a mall. I call it a little shopping center. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, it was pretty good. When I had the chance to go up there and and like you and you you find like-minded people that have done it kind of to give you advice and I was fortunate enough to have there's one person in specific but multiple people that gave me advice on our trip up cuz when I went to Alaska we went all the way to Prudhoe Bay and mm. Prudhoe Bay is once you get to Fairbanks it's already like you think that you've accomplished a lot when you get to Fairbanks like okay this is under wraps there's 400 miles to go how bad can the Dalton Highway be you know, so we did a lot of conversating with people like preparing for this. What do we need? How do we get through this? How do we, you know, tire chains? Where do we get the right tire chains? And so on. And we had this, so we get to Fairbanks, we get to this little truck stop, the hilltop truck stop. We take off our fenders on the drives because we knew we were going to be chaining up a lot. And we had an RGN, we had an RGN that was loaded. I guess they call it in Alaska tail heavy. Essentially the trailer was right up to max and our drives were lighter than they should be. We weren't hauling weight. We were pulling it. And right. So, okay, we're prepared. We're going to, we're going to do this thing. We're 4,000 miles into this trip. Cause we came from Houston going up there. Wow. And I tell you what, on the second mile, cause right out the gate, you climb this hill and it was like, slap your cheeks. Like we're going into battle. Cause that's, there was, <laughs> it was a straight grind from the beginning. And I'll tell you like the whole trip up there and up to Fairbanks was amazing. The views. And then you get on the Dalton Highway and it's almost like you completely leave civilization and there is nothing like, and you're climbing the side of mountains, feeling like you're the first person to ever do it. It's just feels so right. feels so untouched. And our adrenaline was so high the whole time because it felt for a minute, like life or death is like, if we don't execute this hill, this, there's so many names they have out there for each hill corner, the Attigan pass, the the shelf. Like, I mean, so we're taking notes after each truck passes us. Hey, what do we have ahead of us? What do we need to do? And everybody's friendly up there because they don't want you to crash because right. that can shut down the road. So they're like, okay, you're going to have this in three miles and you need to make sure to do this. There's a pull off, make sure you're chained up and so on and so on. And, and every time we saw a truck, we pulled out a notepad, took all the notes, and then we'd lose CB connection. Cause we didn't have a ham radio. We just had a regular CB. Yeah. So, we once we lost sight of that truck, it was like there goes our advice, and back to kind of feeling like you're solo explorers again. And had I not had another driver to team with, I don't know that I'd have survived. There's so much chaining and unchaining, and it was. I I got lucky in I missed all the storms, so my whole trip, as even though I never saw the asphalt, I never did have to chain. Yeah. I got really lucky. Those veterans, like you said, the local people in Alaska, they were so helpful, but they're not afraid to get it done. We got past that. We had to pull over several times because that road, you slow down when you meet somebody because it's such a tight, narrow road. But Mm -hmm. we let many people pass us because we're like, hey, A, we're heavy. And B, we only have one set of tire chains. We didn't buy two, so we can't wear these out. So (laughs) we can't do... and. I just will never, ever forget that whole, that last portion of the trip. Cause it was such an adrenaline rush. We got up there. They were almost cheering for us. Cause as drivers talk, you know, they have their big radios and 
when we yeah. got up there, they're like, you guys made it. Like, congratulations. Cause I saw two trucks wrecked on that. And those are veterans. One truck had a load of pipe that was off in the bush and it was just scattered everywhere pipe. And he was just sitting wow. there because they're not a priority if you're off the road. And then on the way back, there was a tanker actually hanging off the side of this, I guess I'd say mountain, right? Cliff mountain. And the road mm-hmm. was shut down and we were sitting there until they pumped it out into another truck and then pulled that truck back up. And those drivers oh are gosh. veterans. So you can about imagine oh. like our mind every time we saw that, heard that, like, oh, this is, we're not done until we're done. There's no getting complacent here. Yeah, on those bigger mountains, I can only imagine how that would feel. I, I don't want to do that during the winter. I have the same feeling being alone with not without riding it with someone that winter trip. I don't even know how to describe the feeling. It's you know you're alone. There's nobody around. If anything does happen, it could be hours or uh, even a day or so yeah. before you get in touch with anyone. Well, and one of the things, like I said, we've, we've spoken to many people before we left and bringing supplies, specifically tools and some of the common things like we brought extra glad hands. We had some extra fittings that we, you know, we made sure we had enough tools to, to change a brake line or clamp it off. Like we were kind of trying to have the bare essentials to make sure that right. if something happened, I can pull over and hopefully MacGyver or something to get out of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the spots, because like I said, we were up to gross weight on our trailer. So when we got into Alaska, it was snowing so bad that we accumulated so much snow that we went into the scale that they said, well, you're overweight on your trailer. And I'm like, here's all the scale tickets to prove that we were legal. Right. All the way up. And they still were like, nope, you got to get out there and you got to get within tolerance. So we had shovels and spent pulled in the back of the scale and spent all that time shoveling off the side of the trailer in between the cross members, everything we could do. And from that point on every scale we hit, we were overweight. So we had to do the same process to get within where they would let us roll. So there was a lot of adversity that we came up against the whole trip. Leah, luckily my load was not that heavy. I had snow. You couldn't even see the fifth wheel. Yeah. When I went to get that window done, the guy asked me, to drop the trailer well the ice was so thick i started trying to chip it off with a hammer he saw me out there he's like man just pull it in we'll let it drip on the uh, on the inside (laughs) so and also every single morning the trailer i had my brakes would freeze every night no matter what i did yeah that was one of the main things because we had an rgn so we had to make sure that our axles were rolling because last thing you want to do is drag an axle especially in the middle of nowhere and burn right. up, burn up a set of duels, and now you're you're stuck. Yeah, definitely. There was a couple mornings where you know it was like twenty below, and I'm out there trying to chip ice and uh, laying under the trailer, trying to hit the drum with the hammer and not break anything at the same time. It was it was sporty. It's kind of funny thinking about it as we're talking, like. It sounds like everything we're saying is a reason that you wouldn't want to go. But when you look back on it, it's such a good experience that it's like the, cha- the harder the challenge, the more you're attracted to do it. And that's for me what it was is like, this is extreme. This is extreme trucking and you got to be on your game on point. That's exactly why I did it. And, yeah. and you're right. It's, it's that adrenaline rush you get from, from having to do all of it. It actually, that's what made the trip. Yeah. It's, and for many of the drivers that we've had that have had the opportunity, it's the same thing. Like I've never done it. It's a bucket list. I want to, you know, I'm curious what this is going to be like. And then when they come back, they're usually like, it was amazing. Especially if you get to go in the summer, they get to really take it in, but they're just like, I just can't believe it. Like you have that much windshield time. It's that much open, vast area that is just wide open. They're not, you're not caught up with traffic, a Chicago incident, like sitting there waiting, like, You're just driving. Yeah. And 13 to 15 hours a day. (laughs) Yeah. And the hours, there's so many things that change. You get into the first, you cross into Canada, you're dealing with customs. That's kind of intense already. If the driver hasn't done that, then you're crossing scales in Canada that are in kilograms. It's metrics. So now it's a whole different process. Again, things are a little different feeling. There's new speed limits and laws and then hours of service increase. Then you get up into Alaska and it's almost kind of like you land back in the homeland. You feel a little sigh of relief, like, okay, I'm, I'm back in home territory. And then you just get that rush of 
it feels like you're just in a snowbank climbing a mountain. And even though you're on a <laughs> paved road, right. Just, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. Uh, and some of the pictures, some of the experiences the drivers have had, cause I usually get all kinds of pictures on these adventures. One of the guys in Fairbanks got to meet up with a dog sled team. Somehow one wow. of the places we were delivering to, whether they, I don't remember if they owned their own team or had all their dogs, but took the driver. He went up to their house. And I've got all kinds of pictures where he's literally on the back of a dog sled riding in there. Wow. Riding around. That's so, amazing. So just not only to top it off, get to do something like that. We stopped it when we went there in the summer. It's a, a night and day different. During the summer, it was so breathtakingly beautiful. It, it was uh, memories I'll never forget. It, mm-hmm. It's just some of those pictures you just, you'll never forget them. And we did stop at a few things, a couple of tourist areas. One of them was the hot springs. Yep. That was interesting. I actually didn't go. I've I've got a hip that bothers me from time to time. And Judd went down and took all kinds of pictures. And I'm like, I really wish I could have walked down there. That'd be awesome. We've also delivered down near Anchorage at Dutch Harbor, where all the Alaskan crab fishing goes on. Oh, yeah. So we've had drivers down there delivering right on the pier where all the boats are and the crab cages. And it's just, it's funny because it's for them up there, it's everyday life. But for us, you're like living through a TV show. Like I've seen deadliest catch and watching all these captains oh, yeah. and, and then they're up there just doing their thing. And that would be a good place to go next. I've been to Anchorage. I've been to Fairbanks. Dutch Harbor would be a good one. <laughs> when we went to Prudhoe Bay, there's a truck stop halfway between Fairbanks and Prudhoe Bay in cold, it's called Coldfoot. And there's a little restaurant there, truck stop restaurant. So there's the one and the only one, right? It's a, And so you can't miss it. There's a little like dining section that has, this is Ice Road Truckers that's filmed here. Like it was there on the show when they were, you know, cutting it up, I guess you'd say, drinking their coffee I've and breakfast. I've probably seen it, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of cool to be in that. I bought a a zip up from there. I'm like, this, this is something I'll remember for. I still have it and still wear it. So little, yeah, yep. little, little memorabilia. Yeah. I bought a bunch of shirts and you know, that grandkids had to have shirts. So every stop was actually cost me money. It, the trip probably cost me money because all the uh, souvenirs I bought, <laughs> but <laughs> you have it, to, you it have was to. well worth it. Oh yeah. You never know. I might've been my only time ever getting up there. So talking with other drivers, do you run into many drivers that have been up into Alaska trucking or is it is it truly kind of a novelty where not many have done it? Not many. And when I bring it up, you know, the people I ask, you know, where do you run? And, you know, I'll tell them, the, you know, lower 48, Canada and Alaska. They're like, oh, you go to Alaska. Yeah, most of them can't imagine it mm-hmm. uh, or don't believe it. Some of them don't even believe it. Yeah. Like you don't go to Alaska during the winter. I'm like, yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like you said, winter is tough. And one of the reasons that the, from Fairbanks to Prudhoe Bay gets utilized so much in the winters because it's so tough in the summer, it's mud, dirt, the rocks are even more thrown up. And so they, they actually travel it more in the winter and the weight restrictions, they can haul more. So it's, mm-hmm. so the worst time of year is when they best use it. And it's my understanding from Fairbanks on up, the roads are a lot worse too, as far as not paved, a whole lot of gravel roads. I mean, there's some down in the Yukon and Alaska, but my understanding is there's a lot more up there. Oh, yeah. So you're definitely interested in going back up there and you'd do it again. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that we pair up with our customers. They know we go to Alaska. And, and of course, when there's a project, like you had said, you and Judd went, it's really fun to pair drivers up and let them share that experience together. And it's also safer because they have somebody else to your point case, like you break down or your window blows out. You're like, yeah, and, definitely. And that's not the first time you're not the first guy that's happened to us. We had another driver blow out his window as well. Yeah. That's what I was told when it happened. They said, that's not unusual. I'm yeah. like, what? <laughs> it seemed yeah. like a, a freak accident. They're like, no, this has happened before. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting scenario nowadays with the trucks and the the technology and the electronics. And you get a little concerned, like, 
with just the sustainability of it going up there because there's not a lot of places to get things fixed. Yeah. If you ever needed the tire, it could be 10, 12, 14 hours for a tire truck to get there. Oh yeah. Let alone like you have service. Like you just have to be prepared for everything and double check, triple check all of that's there. Your tires are rolling all every, you know, all your lights and everything is working because once you leave city, Oh yeah. You're on your own. And during the winter, you have to stop about every 50 to a hundred miles and clean your lights off. But definitely before every way station, because they'll make you do it. So much snow blows up that it ends up caking the whole back of the trailer, Mm -hmm. three, four, five inches thick of snow built up and they make you clean, clean them off. I found that out the first way station that, yeah, you're good, except pull over there and clean your back brake lights off. So speaking of inspections, did you get inspected at any of the scales? Typically in Alaska, when you enter, you get inspected. Yeah, there at Toke, yep. I got my logs inspected, and that guy was, uh, well, he's not a really friendly, friendly guy. We'll just <laughs> say that. <laughs> the three guys that were in front of me, all three of them got inspections. Yeah, I just got my logs inspected, and everything looked good, even though he kept asking me, you know, when, was, when was the last time you got an inspection? I'm like, you got it pulled up on the screen right there. And yeah. You're, you know, he's just, his demeanor, it was so, he was very, he was very arrogant. And it was be, very hard for me not to get a, be a smart aleck with him. But I said, you know, you got it right there on the screen. It's like last month. And he's like, okay, okay. I'm just testing you. I'm like, you don't, <laughs> and then he says, you don't have copies of your, past inspections in your book i said no one's ever told me that was a a thing yeah and i've asked other dot officers since it's not a thing it was a thing for him Mm -hmm. but other officers said you know if that is something no one's ever told me about it and this particular one had been doing it for 20 some years yeah well and like i said our trip was in total 4500 miles and the one scale that we assumed was going to be an inspection was toke. And it was, we pulled in and especially oversized, bringing your permit in, let's go through all this. Let's make sure you're good. The weight, we were overweight. So we had to shovel it off, which he understood because he's obviously in Alaska, but yeah, you come into that with such a energized feeling. And then those guys or gals can sometimes take the fun out of it, but that's where you got to stay composed. Like you said, and, and work through it. Yeah, we got really lucky on the second trip. Judd and I, on the way up, I actually had phone service for a few minutes and checked Trucker Path, and it said that the way station was closed. I'm like, Judd, we can't stop. We got to go. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually made it, and it was still closed when we got there. And on the way back, same thing. It closed as we were coming down the road. It was white. You could tell it was, you know, it was the sign was saying open. We saw it turn red closed. Just drove oh. right on by all the way back to. <laughs> I thought one of the interesting things as well is when you're in, you know, Northern Alberta and British Columbia, how many big, big logging trucks there are. They're not just like your run of the mill logging truck. You see in the lower 48, these are tandem steer axle. Like they are big. Yes. Yes, they're not definitely not your normal trucks. You, when you're in a semi, you're already big feeling, but you get next to those trucks and you're like, okay, I'm driving a, a little model truck here compared to what you have. I actually got got to feel that on the way back on my winter trip. I went down somewhere near Edmonton. Uh, my, 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 yeah, I think it was was west and north of Edmonton and picked up lumber. And several of those trucks were in there and I got to feel how big they really were because they were right beside me. And it's, Mm -hmm. those things are huge. Yeah. I don't know why I was so oblivious or I don't know, maybe there's just no reason to know that, but it's like you get to Edmonton and you leave Edmonton all of a sudden, boom, the trucks have changed. They're, they're the monster trucks of trucks and yes, you stay out of their way. They're, they own the road. I have a bigger CB, a higher power CB. So I was able to talk a lot and the, all the drivers, like you were saying, very, very helpful and kind of most of them ended up pretty much laughing that 
some of the questions I've a- I've had. They're like, <laughs> you know, so yeah, you're definitely a rookie. You're you're a greenhorn. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> when we got to Prudhoe Bay, it was so cold that the machine we were hauling wouldn't start, but they're used to that. So they had all these, I guess you'd call them heaters with big tubes, right? Like a 12 inch mm-hmm. tube. And they piped it, laid them underneath the machine, piped it into the side of it. And they said, okay, we need about three hours to warm this up and go inside the trailer. Like, we'll walk you over here. Cause you're literally, everything is on skis up there. It's like you see in the movies, everything's on skis, tracks, all the, there's big tractors, everything's on tracks, walk up into the little trailer and there's a buffet in there. Right. So there, there's all the oh, workers wow. sitting there. They're like, Hey, come on over. They, they, it wasn't like, what are you doing here is, Hey, you just won't get over here. You're going to eat. Here's the trays. Here's what you do. And so we loaded up our trays and there's ribs and it was, food was awesome. And we sit down and the right away, we're talking to them, right. About everything. There's signs all over the walls inside the trailer about, I'm pretty sure it's code blue. And that's a polar bear sighting. And I don't, it could be cold white, but I'm, I, for some reason I feel like it was cold blue, but there's that's So it's not so much like fire danger and this oh, and that wow. it's be prepared for a polar bear. And obviously it was so cold and everybody, I had spot special coveralls that I still have. It's like they were made for that environment. And I don't know if I could ever wear them out. And yeah, the whole experience yeah, it's too much for down here. You'd be burning up. Yeah. And <laughs> we got unloaded. That was finally like, okay, mission accomplished. Cause we were, like you said, the GPS is kind of fall off the radar. Your cell phones don't work. Everybody in the back home office couldn't hear or see us, whether it was on the GPS or not for like, until we got up to the Prudhoe Bay when service, you know, 15 miles out, my phone started dinging, like their yeah. sales service. And when we called, they're like, man, I did not know if you guys were caught up in something or what was going on. We haven't heard from you in 20 hours. Like, are you all right? And like, we're here. Like, we've made it. We're going to unload. But that's just half the battle. We still got to get out of here. That's really interesting that you said that because that's how you know when you're getting somewhat close to a town, your phone has done nothing for hours. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Getting 10 email notifications, notifications from messages. It, it's, you, you know, you're getting close to a town. Yep. We delivered, ate that food, got unloaded. I mean, it was so cold that we had to heat up our pony motor on the hard, like, like by with our hand, I had to hand choke it because that couldn't, it wouldn't choke yeah. enough. And so it was just the kind of primitive. We were out there and got rested up. And then on our way back, it was still a grind. We had to chain up often because we weren't heavy enough. Now we were light. So we would just spin out yeah. trying to climb those oh, mountains. Yeah. And when we got to Fair, back to Fairbanks, it was mission accomplished. We felt like we we're on top of the world. Just couldn't believe that we were, you know, we were focused and, and disciplined, but you kind of look back and you're like, wow, that is a mission. It really is. And we've had several drivers that have went all the way to Prudhoe Bay several times and they're very successful at it it's, and they're by themselves. And I'm like, man, you guys have oh, wow. nerves of steel to do that. Definitely. I, I wouldn't want to go any, now that I've done it, I, I, I could do the Anchorage or Fairbanks it's really not as bad as I, what I expected it to be. Yeah. But from there on up, I would not want to be alone. <laughs> yeah. It's, so now that you've accomplished that twice, what else is on your bucket list? Like what other kind of trip? Is there any Northeastern you've been up into Nova Scotia or any of that? Yeah. I've been all over Canada with the company before this, other than the Alaska trips, I might've only been to Canada once here. Previously I've used the company I worked for, I was up there a lot. I've been pretty much everywhere across Canada, and if it's a major city area. Yeah. The one place that I think would be interesting to go to is Newfoundland, because you got to take a, a barge to get over there. The ferry, yeah. Or a ferry, yeah. yeah, excuse me. And we've done that. We've had a few drivers that went up there, and of course, it's very hands-on, because you're making sure they the ferry's set up, it's prepaid, and all this, and super cool, and they got up there and sent pictures. It's, once again, it's like being in Alaska or... If anyone's ever had the chance to be in Hawaii, like you're so far, you're, you're your own island and it's just different when you're on it. It's like a different world. It, it almost really is. I would like to go there. I've, I've got uh, one buddy that's been to Nova Scotia before and that would be a place I'd like to visit. Yeah. Super cool. Do you have any tips, any insights for somebody that's never taken a trip to Alaska that's going to take their first one? take plenty if it's winter and make sure you got plenty of clothes but biggest thing is fuel and death even if you got 
enough fuel to make it to your next stop, you don't know if they got fuel or mm-hmm. death. So if you're somewhere where you can get it, go ahead and stop and top off, even if it's just an extra quarter of a tank, especially with these new trucks. Uh, th- these were smaller. And we did run into a situation where EFS was shut down at one of the way stations has a card lock right beside it. And we stopped there the last time, but it was EFS was down. So we ended up having to pay for fuel at the little Exxon gas station right down the street there. Yeah. So you always have to be prepared, have extra clothes, fuel, def, have a, even, a, you know, if we get our hands and are able to give that driver a credit card, we try to, because there are those situations where you just, there's no other, you know, some places won't take the card yeah. on the phone. They won't do this. So, and that's it, what we ran into. It, I had your card. Yeah. They wouldn't manually put it in. So, you know, yeah, I, you're up against the wall in there. You got to do what you got to do. Well, we definitely appreciate you doing that. Uh, tools, all the little, anything you can do to be resilient to prepare for one of those. One thing I wish I had taken would be one of those small trenching shovels that has a short handle on it. It would make it so much easier clearing the ice out from under the truck, trying mm-hmm. to get the brakes unstuck. Yeah, I did it with a hammer, and that took a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like chipping away quarter by quarter. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, Rick, I definitely appreciate you sharing your story with us. I know I'm going to have you a guest again because you have displayed some awesome traits. And like I said, you're a professional of professionals. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kiwi. Uh, I've enjoyed it here for five years and I have a feeling I'll probably retire here, which hopefully is about another two or three years. But you know well, how plans go. They never work out. Well, that's what we want. We want to make sure that you're happy. And like I said, you do a great job and you set the bar. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That's it for this episode of Keep Trucking Personal. Please tune in next week as we will have a special guest that you will not want to miss. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Keep Trucking Personal. We appreciate you taking the time to explore the heart and soul of Kiwi Brothers Trucking with us. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to let us know your thoughts. Tune in next time as we continue our journey together, diving deeper into what makes us a community a catalyst for positive change, and a home for those who aspire to be part of something truly extraordinary. Until then, keep trucking, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Uh...